Okay, so as I mentioned tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the uh, multiphase diffusivity equation. And again, we'll have an oil continuity equation, a water continuity equation, if I can find the mouse. You're going to hear me screaming at this thing a lot because I can't see very well. We'll have a uh, gas continuity equation. Why is the gas continuity equation so much bigger? Sorry? The free, the free right, there's a free gas and a uh, gas from water and a gas from oil. Now, we haven't really talked about this very much, but this is the uh, gas from water term. What do you, what's the scale of RSW? How big do you think it is? Standard cubic feet per stock tank barrel. It ranges from about 5 to 30 standard cubic feet per stock tank barrel. That's not a lot of gas. Okay. In theory, we probably could just ignore it and move on, but we won't. And then, of course, the RSO is usually in the thousands. So that would be where we'd have thousands of standard cubic feet per stock tank barrel. What are the VOs and the VGs and the VWs? Those are velocities of um, oil, gas, and water. And how are we going to represent that? Well, obviously, we're represented by Darcy's Law. Uh, I've also given the comment that we'll represent density uh, in terms of formation volume factor. And we can touch base on that later, but that's just a convention that we're using. So we have three independent equations, one for oil, one for gas, and one for water. And we're going to combine them. Is there anything missing here? Okay, we have gas coming out of oil. Can we have oil coming out of gas? So we're, we're not talking about condensate, we're talking about a black oil. We usually don't think about it in that context. We usually think about a black oil as being a black oil and not having a lot of liquid generated from the gas that results from that. This uh, model ha or this particular formulation has another term which is often referred to as little RSO, and you'll see some papers, uh, particularly those from Norway, that uh, include that term in it. So there, there is a, a possibility of another equation uh, over here where there'd be a, a, a free oil and then an oil from gas, but we're not going to worry about that. Can you get oil from water? That'd be a neat trick. Yeah, Just thought I'd ask. Sorry, I just wanted to play a little trick on you. Okay, so the next discussion is what's our control equation for equation of motion, and that'll be Darcy's Law. Now, in this particular case, each phase designated by I, you have a Ki, a mu I, and a delta Pi. Ki is the effective permeability to that phase. Mu I is the viscosity to that phase. What's delta Pi or del Pi? That's a pressure gradient for that phase. So somebody mentioned last night about capillary pressure. These phases will be connected by capillary pressure. Okay, But obviously, if we add capillary pressure to this derivation, we now have a relationship with saturation. This is going to get really ugly really fast. So what's the easiest way to deal with that? How do we deal with everything we don't like? We neglect it. So we're going to neglect capillary pressure. We're not going to neglect relative permeability or effective permeability. We're not going to neglect relative permeability or effective permeability, but we are going to neglect capillary pressure. Okay. Okay. How many of you believe that you've seen the devil now? This is the gas, the oil, and the water equation written in total form. We assume that there are no capillary forces, as I mentioned a moment ago. So that's here. And then we have the gas equation in its total form. We have the oil equation in its total form.
I didn't ask. I mean, it was kind of rude of me. I hope everybody had a good night last night, being Halloween, Santiago. You know, the Day of the Dead today. Chico, are you celebrating the Day of the Dead? So what are you going to do for the Day of the Dead? Yeah, Maybe you can tell us all later, huh? Yeah. Okay, well, come back to us with a report. Okay, so if you were coming to me from our earlier discussions this week, are you satisfied that you recognize equation 2 and equation 3? Yes, but. What's the but? It has a saturation term. Okay. So we're not dealing with single phase flow anymore. There are no capillary pressure terms, but there are uh, relative permeability and saturation terms. And I'll go on ahead and put a circle around that. I hope everybody's okay with tomorrow at noon. I, I couldn't remember exactly what we said, so I, I just said noon. I know that's before you usually get up there, Avery, but it's okay. Really? I thought this was just one big vacation for you. Oh, we're being recorded, man. Speak your mind. Okay, so we're going to have to have a relationship between Capital, or sorry, between relative permeability and saturation at some point? Yes or no? Not exactly. Because we can work this entire problem without having to deal with this, the capillary pressure. Oh, dang, I've got to stop saying capillary pressure. We can deal with this whole problem without resorting to what the model is for relative permeability and saturation. Now, to apply it, you'll have to have a model. But this derivation, we won't. Okay, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to neglect, again, all the things we don't like. Every I get the feeling I'm going to be in your Christmas list for things you don't like. So we're neglecting, first of all, the gradient squared terms. Everybody's okay with that? We did that before. Now we're neglecting the saturation gradient and the pressure gradient multiplication terms. What happens is when we perform the expansions on the left-hand side, we end up with, because K0 is a function of saturation, then we're going to end up with the, the gradient of uh, K0 with respect to distance, but we're also going to end up with a gradient of saturation. So the way we work this out, and again, I'm not showing you all the steps here, but is that we'll, we'll simply neglect the uh, saturation gradient pressure gradient terms. We don't have to neglect the, the gas term because it, it gets neglected anyway by neglecting the others. Okay, so the near final form before we start is here. Are there any questions about this form? This now looks exactly like the starting point we had last night. Or actually it looks like the finishing point we had, right? So we have, if we look at the oil equation, we have an oil term on the outside. We have this, we have that, and then we have the uh, entire term over here that contains the gas, the oil, the water, and I need to be using the mouse, sorry. We have this term, which includes the gas, the oil, the water, the gas, the oil, the water, and we work our way into uh, how we're going to manipulate these. How do you want to start? Anyone? What's your logic? Uh, sorry, question. Are we still considering the K over uh, Actually, that's a really good question, and the answer is not exactly. We're going to, um, I think, uh, let me think. I think you're right. I think we did to break it out here. I'm trying to remember. But we know they're functions of pressure, which is kind of confusing me here. 
Uh, obviously, it's been a long time since I looked at the, the details of this. Um, let me say that for the moment, equations 7, 8, and 9 are our starting point, and it will assume that whatever we did to get there was rigorous. Now, the algebra to go from 7, 8, 9 to the final reduction is the objective, but that's a really good question because the only way we could have gotten there, actually, I think, no, these are not constant. This is using the product rule. Miss Lee's nodding her head. That's right, they're not constant because using the product rule, this these terms are functions of pressure. We simply factored them out. And then neglecting these other terms, the other terms here, here, and here, that's that's the ones where we get rid of the things we, we didn't want. So yeah, getting to this point, these are all still variables. Good, really good question. Thank you. All right. No, go ahead. Okay, where would you start? You've got three equations and only one connection variable. Pressure. Del squared P for equation 8 and equation 9 suggests the starting point should be to equate those two, I assume. Yeah. Right, you'd solve each one of those for del squared P and then set it equal and then take that equation and start working it into the gas equation. Um, I could be wrong because, again, I don't have the detail in front of me, but what I recall is whenever I derive this, and I'm, I'm not sure, I think I may have left that out of here, uh, we start with this one. And it's a little bit intuitive. You take the simplest part, make a relationship, and then you work your way towards the more difficult part. Okay, so this is what happens at the end, and I know this is really confusing to look at, but what we end up finally is an equation that looks like this. This is a final result, and this is a final result. So in order to get to the bottom, this Martin equation 12, you had to define the total mobility and the total compressibility in this fashion. Okay, There's about 10 pages of derivations being skipped here, but if you go backwards, what we're going to do is take equations 7, 8, and 9 and derive the total compressibility equation and the total pressure and total mobility relation. All these equation numbers are uh, Perrine's paper. Sorry, uh, Martin's paper. It's called the Perrine-Martin method because Perrine proposed it first. Okay, so when you stare at this total compressibility term, it just becomes CO times SO. Let me put a circle around that. And then at the end, I added a stealth term for C sub F. That's formation compressibility because this derivation was not worked, sorry, in terms of that. Okay. So looking at the COSO, CWSW, CGSG, and then adding the the stealth term of the formation compressibility. That's the definition of total compressibility. Now, if you want to know where this really came from, Perrine proposed this intuitively. He said that it's, you know, the total compressibility should be the saturation of the oil multiplied by the compressibility of the oil, the saturation of the water multiplied by the compressibility of water, saturation of the gas multiplied by the compressibility of the gas, and that seems logical, and this derivation proves that that's true. He also said that there was a total mobility function 
and the total mobility function would be defined as the mobility of the oil plus the mobility of the water plus the mobility of the gas and you can see that's given down at the bottom as well. Okay and this unfortunately is illegible because it's way too small but this is how we derive those first groups of equations and it's the steps that you go through to get to um, the 7, 8, 9 starting point. So I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to show you that we go on ahead. Good God, this really is too small. Somebody should type this up for me, Avery. And so what we do is we work our way through for the gas equation, then for the oil equation, and then for the water equation. And this is sort of our starting point. Uh, we then have equations 19, 20, and 21, which are not the, uh, the starting point 7, 8, 9, because we have to do the expansions. Now we're going to do the expansions, and I'm going to zoom in. Uh, no, take the weekend. Okay, so remember that the definition of the uh, del dot is the same as a derivative. So del dot A times P is del A del P plus A del dot del P. So it's the same as a product rule. Uh, however you want to recognize it, that's what it's going to look like. So that's the identity given by 28, or sorry, 23, or 22. Can't read my own writing. And then we note that this term is nonlinear, and we either have to you know, account for it or or uh, neglect it and in a moment we'll show you why we're going to neglect it so Chico to your question this A inside of here can be a function of P and so all we're doing is moving it out to here and here okay so that's a great question thank you Yes, I know you asked a good question. It wasn't an Avery style question. No, no, I think an Avery style question just is asked to confuse the instructor. Okay, so I want to get out of this. Okay, there we go. All right, the next thing we need to do is we need to differentiate uh, using this uh, chain rule type approach. And so we're going to need a gradient term. And what it ends up as is we have del A is equal to the partial derivative of A with respect to the uh, group, in this case, uh, SO. And then you can see where we're working our way out uh, using that. So in this particular case, we're going to expand in terms of saturation of oil, saturation of water, and pressure. Miss Lee, why did we not bother with saturation of gas? Why did we not have a saturation of gas term? Because SO plus SW plus SG is equal to 1, and therefore those two are the only ones we need to know. Okay, And so we also need an expansion in terms of pressure, uh, because it's, not, it's a function of water saturation, of, of oil saturation, and then also of pressure. So when we take this expansion and we work it back, then we have uh, this uh, del dot term that yields A del squared P. And then we have the remainder term, which is uh, what Chico was asking about earlier, which is this term times uh, del P. So sort of uh, along the lines of here's all the detail for that particular expansion. So now we need to go back and we need to make this manipulation for each case. Hopefully I don't lose too much. There we go. And we now set, uh, insert this into the gas equation and you can see the entire mess that it creates. Chico, this is the term you were asking about. And class, this is the saturation gradient here. This is the saturation gradient here. 
and this is a pressure gradient squared term here. Okay, so the saturation gradient times pressure gradient, saturation gradient times pressure gradient, and then pressure gradient squared. Sorry for that. Okay. Yeah, we're still trying to get to 789, okay? This is the part that's not included in the uh, gas uh, monograph or gas uh, well testing textbook. So that's why I included it here. The rest of the derivation is given there. And when we do that, obviously something has to be eliminated. And then we do it for the oil equation. We do it for the water equation. We have an oil saturation term. We have a pressure gradient squared term. We have a water saturation gradient term. These things, what we have to do is we have to come along and we have to say, hey, look, you know, I can't handle this. I cannot deal with the saturation gradient times pressure gradient, the saturation gradient times pressure gradient, and then the pressure gradient times pressure gradient. So bang, I'm going to walk away from that. And when I do, we get the equivalent of equation 7, 8, and 9, which is 28, 29, and 30. Okay, so that's our real starting point. So for all the detail to get to equation 7, 8, and 9, which is essentially the starting point of the derivation, this is where we have to end up. No shortcuts, no anything other than what? Neglecting the gradients and neglecting capillary pressure. That's it. Oh, great question. I never told you because we want to. Okay, so we assume that, that the saturation profile near the point of interest is constant. Therefore, its gradient is zero. So, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, that's not true because near the well is where the biggest gradients will be. So this is going to fail exactly where we don't want it to fail. But that's okay. For the sake of argument, we've, and, and that's what I was telling you earlier, is that people were trying to do simulation studies to test the validity of the Perrine-Martin concept. So that's exactly where the problem lies, is when is the saturation gradient, pressure gradient term not negligible? And so you'd have to investigate that. Yes. Sorry? Oh, no, no, no. This is, uh, well, in a way it would be, uh, I don't have an easy way to draw a graph. Uh, yeah, it's going to be near the well. I mean, I could probably fake trying to draw something here. So if we're looking at near the well, and, you know, the pressure gradient near the well is potentially going to look like this. Or, the sorry, the pressure performance near the well. So... The gradient over here is where, yeah, is where the challenge is going to be because right. okay. it's going to be huge. Well, that's what I was saying is that, you know, you really shouldn't be doing this anyway, and now it's irrelevant because you'll just simulate it. But what we're trying to do with this is by creating this single equation, we're saying that, okay, we can go into a case and we can look at the total rate, the oil, gas, water rate combined together in a, on a molar basis or on a mass basis, however you want to try it, and you could work the problem with that total rate and pressure and pressure. But... What it's telling us here is anytime you have a high gradient, these these terms are not going to be negligible, and then you're going to have a problem. So I've drawn it here as a pressure gradient. The saturation gradient could be going down. It could be going up. We don't know for sure. could be gas. could be water. could be oil. But what's going to happen is there will be a non-trivial gradient near the well. Okay. So equations 28, 29, and 30 are the equivalent of 7, 8, and 9 in the uh, Martin paper. Okay, and for the moment, 
I have to say that we're going to skip the rest of the derivation. Uh, I'm not going to give you that, I don't think. It would be nice if I did, but I, I gave it last year, so I'm probably not going to give that derivation. It's in the text of um, the lecture. Uh, I didn't copy it, but it's it's somewhere in the, the, the original lecture. It'll be in the text for that. But I just wanted you to get a feel for how you get to those equations. Now, how many pages is it going to take you to reduce 7, 8, and 9 into 10? Uh, it depends on you, but it's, it's not trial and error. There's just only one way to make the algebra work out, and it's pretty painful. I remember doing it the first time. Okay, so now looking at phase behavior of oil and gas systems, we need to talk very quickly. I know we looked at this somewhat before. This is the formation volume factor. Okay, so there's that term. What's your favorite color, Chico? Blue, right? Azul. And then above the bubble point, what happens with the formation volume factor is there's a little bit of compression. Okay, so that's what happens below and above the bubble point for the formation volume factor. For the R sub S, and I think I can do this. I hope I'm smart enough to do this. Wow. Sometimes it just works out. This is the solution gas oil ratio. What is the solution gas oil ratio above the bubble point class? It's constant. it's constant. That's correct. All right. And then next, is the viscosity. How many of you consider yourselves to be pretty familiar with PVT? Anybody? Turn on. You're the only one that raised your hand. What am I going to ask you, Turn on? You don't know? Or you don't want to know? Did everybody have a good day today? I mean, being the Day of the Dead and all. Man, that's a funky looking line. Every, I'm really glad you're willing to share your sensitive side on the Cheech and Chong thing. Okay, where's the minimum? Why? Why is the minimum viscosity at the bubble point? Sorry? Okay, so above the bubble point, we're dealing with compression effects. The more we squeeze the molecules, the more viscous it becomes. Below the bubble point, we have got gas coming out of solution. So that makes it heavier, the remaining oil, so it's more viscous. Okay. Now, as Dr. McCain will tell you, there's only one place in petroleum engineering where Mother Nature, as he puts it, takes her feet off the ground. And this is that place.
So Avery, what you doing this weekend? Oh yeah. Wow, sounds pretty major. You ever want to murder your professor? Because y'all are helping me to get a good job. But what if instead we became an antagonist? My hope is that it's not that you hate me. Uh, you can feel the love. All right, class, why does Mother Nature take her feet off the ground here? It's because of this. Because all of a sudden we go from not having the gas and solution to having the gases. Okay, so this is 1 over B dB dP. So there we're taking the derivative like that. That's that term. What's the derivative of RSO dP below the bubble point? Or sorry, above the bubble point. It's zero. Okay. So here it has magnitude but here it's zero. So what happens when you have a function like that? What's going to happen when you have the two red lines which imagine are slopes? What's the slope? Well this is just RSO not BOs on the other one but well, I can go on ahead and put it on there if you want me to. Man, it's really hot up here. I think it's the headphones. I wasn't meant to be Dr. Dre. Okay? So, you like that, huh? Yeah. So, the two combine together, what happens? Above the bubble point, we only have compression of the fluid. Below the bubble point, we have what? We have fluid expansion, but we also have uh, solution gas evolving out of it. So the compressibility of the liquid below the bubble point gets spongier and spongier and spongier. Does that make sense? Okay. It's not the compressibility of the liquid. It's the compressibility of the liquid and the vapor in the liquid. That's the key. You can tell by looking at the equation. That's what we're talking about. Okay, I'm going to skip this. The reason that I left this in is because if 1 over mu OBO is constant, then what? Then we don't need pseudo pressure. Okay. For the sake of argument, it's sort of constant. So we'll say that's all right. Next is what's the behavior mu OCO? Avery, what do you think? What's the behavior of mu OZO? Is it, is it constant here? It's wanting to approach towards being constant. Class, do you agree? I'm not going to say it is, but it's fine. Why not? You don't trust me? You think I'm trying to walk you down some path just to confuse you? Sometimes you're leading questions or leading. Or leading. How would you ever suggest that I would try to fool another human being? Teach by abuse. Hmm. That's the Tom Craddock method. Get it? Oh, that was good.
Okay, so it appears to be constant there. Whenever we look at the top, uh, the plots on the top row, um, the data is simply replotted on a log log s scale on the bottom row. Is it constant, class? No. It's not only not constant. What's the slope of that line? It's about two. There's, um, if you look, there's one, two, one. So it's a slope of about two. Is the slope of two good, class? We're trying to assume something's constant here. No, this is really bad. So the oil case is actually worse than the gas case in terms of its behavior of mu o c o. Okay, now we'll talk a little bit about dry gas. I know we've done this before, so let me go back and steal the horizontal line. Okay, here we go. Is this in fact constant? Is it close enough to be constant? Again, we've talked about this so many times you could lecture on it. So at approximately 2,000 PSI, That's a big arrow. You like the big arrow? So who's going to win tomorrow? Are we the favorite? I hope they don't win then. Okay, so at approximately point where I've drawn the blue arrow, everything becomes constant. So we could assume mu z is constant. I, again, I know we've talked about this before. And then the last one will be mu o, or sorry, mu z, mu g c g. Uh, actually, this is the, uh, I'll skip this one. This is the condition for pressure. And you see that it's never constant here. It appears to be sort of constant here, but it doesn't matter because the constant end is on the high side. Okay, so similar to the uh, liquid case. Looks constant. And yet here, what's the slope again, Avery? That one looks like that. It's about one to one, yeah. No, so what we're trying to say is we're not sure the pseudo time uh, correlation or behavior will work here. So uh, in theory, you know, if it's constant, then we could uh, get away without using pseudo time. But in this case, it definitely is uh, not constant. Okay. What is the formation volume factor? It's uh, defined as a volume conversion uh, based on a mass or density uh, standard. So we're looking at the fluid volume and reservoir conditions divided by the fluid volume and standard conditions. This is how we would represent the formation volume factor. So what's its units? It's reservoir volume for stock tank volume, reservoir barrels for stock tank barrels. Um, if you look at a range of the oil and gas formation volume factors, uh, it's pretty healthy. The range is 1.2. So I've seen lower than that, maybe 1.05 for a heavy oil. 
to 2.4 reservoir barrels for stock tank barrel and you need to be careful that 2.4 is really going to be a, a volatile oil it's probably not going to be properly modeled by a black oil scenario gas viscosity 0 0.03 or sorry gas uh, formation uh, volume factor 0 0.03 to 0 0.01 uh, I typically refer to the uh, gas formation volume factor in reservoir barrels per thousand standard cubic feet but you can use whatever is convenient for you. Then a discussion about fluid viscosity and I actually stole this from somebody else. They said it's sort of an internal friction. It's the proportionality to shear rate and shear stress. That's a definition of Newton viscosity and then the, arg the argument that the person made is this sort of is a, uh, a friction. So having said that the typical values that we see the uh, oil viscosity for light oil systems uh, will vary from 0 0.2 to maybe 30 centipoise on the heavy side gas viscosity 0 0.01 to 0 0.05 centipoise and then water is generally uh, pretty consistent high pressure high temperature cases may be lower than one but generally speaking it's usually around one uh, oil can be as high as 10 million centipoise. What is 10 million centipoise going to be? For all intents and purposes, it'll be a solid. <laughs> okay, so the the viscosity at that high really implies that it's a super heavy oil. Okay, and this is a discussion of the uh, fluid compressibility in this case we're looking at CO, CG and CW. Oil above the bubble point typically varies from 5 to 20 times 10 to the minus 6 PSI uh, reciprocal PSI and then oil uh, below the bubble point can be 30 to 200 reciprocal PSI. Gas on the other hand is very compressible it can be from 50 which is a very low number to even a hundred times ten to the minus six uh, reciprocal PSI. Water on the other hand is always usually in the ballpark of three to five uh, times ten to the six reciprocal PSI. Now having said all that we then have to come down and talk about formation compressibility and formation compressibility normally pressured systems the formation compressibility be something like two to ten times ten to the minus six the number most often referred to for normal compressibility will be 3 times 10 to the minus 6 reciprocal PSI. Abnormal could be in the dozens or even hundreds of uh, reciprocal PSI implying there's a lot of uh, energy to be captured from that. Yes sir. Yes ma'am. Sorry. This is reference, generally speaking, to black oils. Oh, because the black oil equation, would, uh, black oil is is still going to have a. Uh, okay, let me stop. Let's make sure we're referring to the same thing. What is your definition of a black oil? Okay, there's there's a difference in the in the definition. What I think of as a black oil is usually an oil of less than 40 degrees API. Okay, and then a volatile oil would be something greater than 40 degrees API. So you know sometimes I say black oil and sometimes I say solution gas drive or spongy oil. Spongy oil is going to be above 40 degrees API. Black oil will be below 40 degrees API. The, the characterization and the forms that I've shown it here is still the same, but it's just a reference as to what the, uh, the general gravity would be. Okay, so let's pick on Santiago. Santiago, what's the uh, density of the oil in most of the fields you work in? Give us a range. Okay, between 20 and 25, Avery. Yes, API gravity, yes, thank you. Korean contingent? 32. 32. 32 is what? What's the definite? What? What is 32 usually referred to? Is that Saudi Arabian light? 
Actually, we could look it up. I don't want to do, oh, I can't hear, but somebody look up, tell me, say, type into Google uh, the uh, API gravity of Saudi Arabian light oil. It's a standard. Nothing? It doesn't give you an instant answer? No, my, my browser's instant. Ah, okay. Every bad carpenter blames their tool, Avery. Sorry? 33. I was going to say 32. So Saudi Arabian light is 32 degrees API. What is West Texas Intermediate? 40? 14? 40. 40. Okay, is that right? Turn pawn? 39. So we're arguing between 39.6 and 40. You know, I heard two people arguing one time when I was your age, and one of them told the other one they were almost an idiot. That was their exact words. So you guys are trying to make me almost an idiot. Okay, so 40 degrees API for West Texas Intermediate. Can you give me some other standards? Okay, well, let me ask you. I mean, this is a little bit awkward because maybe some of you don't drink, but I'm sure Chico does. Chico, you like uh, you like wine? Yes, sir. Red wine? So you can buy cheap red wine or you can buy expensive red wine. It all comes in the same bottle. So on a volume basis, what are you really paying for? You're, you're paying for quality. So you can get Walmart wine for in a... 0.75 liter bottle, or you can get French wine, or you can get Californian wine, etc. Oil is marketed the same way. It's it's the composition, viscosity, uh, other factors, gravity, and so forth. So you know some oils are good for making gasoline. Some oils are good for making nothing. So they're used to make tar. Uh, some oils are good for making jet fuel because of the nature of the naphthenes. Um, you never know until you, I mean each oil is different that's why when somebody refers to the oil price what are they talking about what is Brent crude did you find that Brent B-R-E-N-T yeah what is it yes I understand what's the gravity if he's right I will have to give him a ginger candy that's been in my pocket for three days. Sorry? What did you say? You lied. Okay. So I hope we got that all out of the way. But my definition of a black oil is usually going to be below 40. And of a lighter spongy oil, it'll usually be higher. But characteristically, you still will include the gas term if you have gas. If you don't have gas, then obviously you wouldn't. So for a super heavy oil, okay, so Chico, what's your uh, GOR for your heavy oils in uh, Mexico? Like 50 to 100 or, okay, so 50 standard cubic feet per stock tank barrel would be for, for super heavy or for heavy uh, in Mexico. And I think I'm going to stop here. The rest you can review. These will be the different differential equations. I'll just uh, skip through them and show you where they apply and where they don't. Um, but again, you can skip through. This is the Camacho plot that explains again the uh, total mobility and total compressibility profile. And this is the important one. So why don't we use liquid pseudopressure? What year was this? February 1942. What does this look like? It looks, smells, and tastes like pseudopressure. Muscat, Evinger, 1942. So 23 years before Ramey and Russell et al. went into a cage fight over the definition of gas pseudopressure, muscat defined it this way. Okay. All right, so I'll stop now.
and tomorrow we meet again at noon, right? Noon. Okay, I'll mount this immediately. I just need to get back to the internet. And what else can you think of that we may need to cover? Tom's going to have to do two things this weekend. Well, three, really. I've got some student counseling. I've got to grade some delinquent uh, reports. My, my delinquency, not so much theirs, although there are a few that are delinquent on their part. And I've got to write your test so, or your assignments. And so I'm going to get that done. Turnpond, do you want them to turn in their assignments one at a time or all at once? You sure about that? Okay. It's your misery. Okay. Well, I think implicitly, if he tells me how he wants them turned in, and he works for me, or maybe I work for him, you know, yes, he will grade them, and then I will review it, and then we'll make the uh, we'll return them. I'm going to ask you to submit a single. PDF file with your assignment. I don't care if you write it, type it, smoke it, whatever you do, but whatever you do, it better be perfect. You know, there were people last year that did a magnificent job typing it up. There were people last year that did a non-magnificent job typing it up, but it was still legible. There were people last year that wrote theirs and it took you know, me with an Inspector Clouseau magnifying glass trying to figure out what the hell they were talking about. So if there's any doubt, and I'm speaking to everyone, if there's any doubt about our ability to review this, please type it. I'm not saying you have to type it, but please do. I would also strongly suggest that you do this for yourself, which is to work a given problem out on scratch paper as appropriate and then go back and rewrite it from there or type it in from there. You will make mistakes. Okay? I promise you, you will make mistakes. And the punisher back there is going to be responsible for finding your mistakes. Having spent the last two days reviewing typographical errors, you do not want this to define your future. Comprende? What does that mean? Do your best work. Make it beautiful. Make it a Korean work of art or a Mexican work of art. Although I went to Chewy's today and they took us, they were overflow, so they put us in the bar. And the bar is full of all these pictures, these paintings of Chihuahua dogs preparing food. Uh, that is not the kind of art that I want to see in your, uh, your work, okay? So, a lot of you are going to say, well, how do I turn in my computer output, my results? You will somehow, I don't care if you want to make a paper version of something and then scan it, that's fine. If you don't know how to scan, Paul could show you. If, you don't, if he doesn't know how to do it, I can tell him how to do it. There are ways of making extremely high quality scans in this department, which are relatively compact. Do not send us something that is in separate pages. I want a single PDF file. A couple of years ago I taught a course. This gentleman, no matter how many times I told him that, kept turning his exam in. Do you know what it's like to get 39 separate pages on a, you know, and yes, I have a, you know, I have Adobe so I can concatenate everything. But each page had been scanned separately at ultra high resolution, so it was like five megabytes per page. Yeah, you know, come on, folks. You know how to do this. Just, I'm, I'm lecturing you, but I'm just telling you, make it easy for us. Or maybe I should say it this way. If you make it hard for us, we'll make it hard for you. How's that? Okay? All right, so what's everybody's grade right now? Everybody has an A. What's your grade going to be when the course is over? That's up to you. Me and Turnpine, we're only the traffic cops. You know, we don't want to hear your story. We just view the evidence. How's that? You like that? Yeah. Okay. All right. So everybody have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow at 